Welcome to another episode of Curbside Consults. I'm Siri Kadiri, an editorial fellow with the New England Journal of Medicine. Today, we're going to discuss a topic that I'm very interested in, women in clinical trials. I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Janine Clayton, who is an ophthalmologist and director of the Office of Women's Health with the National Institutes of Health. Dr. Clayton is also a co-chair of the NIH Working Group on Women in Biomedical Careers. Dr. Clayton, thank you for joining us. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what got you interested in this field? Sure. So I have a family of a father with, who's a physician and a mother who's a registered nurse. So was exposed to medicine at an early age and really never thought about being anything other than a physician. I am an ophthalmologist and cornea and uveitis specialist and clinical investigator and was working at the National Eye Institute seeing patients with autoimmune eye disease when a meta-analysis was published that revealed that two-thirds of the visually impaired or blind in the world are women. And the fact that we couldn't explain that, even though women live longer than men and correcting for all of that, two-thirds of the people that are blind or visually impaired, including in the United States, are women. That got me thinking about how important sex and gender are in health and disease. And that's how I got interested in sex and gender, and in women's health. Women were not included in clinical research and clinical studies across the board, across many different topics and disciplines, not just ophthalmology, but cardiovascular disease, digestive diseases, the like. And women were not included for a variety of reasons. In the first case, there was not this recognition that there were differences between women and men that were relevant to be addressed in a clinical study. So women were considered just different from men in the fact that they could become pregnant and their reproductive status and hormonal status was different. So in some ways, women were thought of as just little men. And so the findings from studies that involved just men were applied to women without an understanding that that was a challenge. And so that was many years ago. There was also always a worry that women would become pregnant during a clinical study. And then if that happened, there would be risk to the fetus. So that protection viewpoint was also part of the story all along. And that was before NIH adopted inclusion policies that required that women and underrepresented minority groups be included in NIH supported clinical research studies, including clinical trials, unless there was a scientific reason not to do so. So fast forward. 20, 30 years, we just celebrated our 30th anniversary at NIH of the Office of Research on Women's Health. And now over half of the participants in NIH supported clinical research, including clinical trials, are women. So we definitely have come a long way, but there's still more work to do. What limitations do you think still exist today? So even though women are included in clinical research studies, the results from those studies rarely report by sex. So sex-specific results are rarely reported in the literature, including for phase three clinical trials. And you know how important those phase three clinical trials are for informing clinical decision-making. So in one study, Geller et al. looked at the proportion of studies that were NIH-defined phase three clinical trials and whether any of the publications resulting from them had any information on sex-specific results. And they found fewer than a third of those studies had any publications ever that delineated results for men and results for women so that we could look at those separately. So that's a really big missed opportunity. And we like to call that data hiding in plain sight because that data was collected, that data exists, but unless it's published, we never know what that data shows. And we're losing information and we're not maximizing the return on the investment that we're making, in this case, from publicly funded research. So there's still a lot of work to do in terms of sex-specific results reporting as well as designing studies with inclusion criteria that are sex or gender aware. So let me tell you a little bit about what I mean about that. 
What I mean is that inclusion criteria, like diagnostic criteria, can be influenced by sex. For example, the criteria for autism are skewed towards the male pattern of disease. And if we use those same criteria as inclusion criteria for studies, we can unwittingly include bias in the ascertainment of research subjects for that particular study because they're based on diagnostic or inclusion criteria that are then in themselves biased. So we have work to do there too. It sounds like many of the disease patterns we study are sex skewed and they bias the inclusion criteria. And so it's important to think about accounting for sex in the research question itself. How might this research question be different for women? Almost like what you just said about on the other end, do I need to adjust the inclusion criteria? Do I need to adjust the upper age limit? You know, studies will exclude people over 70. What if the disease manifests later in women than men? And you're going to be a cardiologist. You know very well that ischemic heart disease occurs later in women than men. So if you have an upper age limit of a cutoff, you are going to exclude a large proportion of women from your ascertainment group. And then your study is going to reflect a different distribution, a population that doesn't reflect the people who are actually you're going to be treating, Siri, that have the disease. So We need to be able to have real world populations in our studies, pragmatic trials. I hope you go in and do some clinical trials in your future as a cardiologist so that we can better understand it. Heart failure too, Siri, you know that. And so what role do you think governmental policy has on ensuring that there's sex parity in these trials? So NIH inclusion policy, government policy, all of these kinds of provisions are put in place to make sure that the research that's being conducted includes the people that are affected by the disease. And the individuals that are included in that study reflect the diversity of the populations for whom the research is intended to benefit. So clinicians need that evidence and governments and policymakers play a role in making sure that the research mirrors the populations. And that really is really just about good science. We know that diverse populations included in studies allow us to better understand safety and efficacy of interventions, provides that evidence that clinicians need to be able to individualize treatment decisions for patients. Each patient deserves treatment that is appropriate for them and their particular background, sex, gender, race, or ethnicity, or age. And in order to have that information available to clinicians, we have to design our research with that in mind. So it does take a village, and I think it is um, multiple entities and components of the research enterprise and ecosystem that play a role here. And so I saw that one of the policies that you spearheaded was requiring scientists to consider sex as a biological variable. Can you tell us more about this initiative? Sure. The sex as a biological variable policy was developed in the context of attention to studies that were failed to be reproduced. And one of the approaches that NIH has taken in terms of seeking to enhance reproducibility through rigor and transparency is to examine the rigor with which clinical studies and laboratory studies are designed. The SABV policy requires applicants for NIH vertebrate animal and human studies to account for sex as a biological variable in their research design, in the research analysis, and in their research reporting. And we expect investigators to factor sex into their research questions, how they design their experiments, how they report their results. And as we move forward, we're seeing more and more knowledge gained by including sex as a biological variable. Another provision of the policy requires investigators to provide scientific justification for single sex studies. There are certainly situations where single sex studies are appropriate for the research question at hand, but now those have to be justified scientifically. What sort of regulation happens to ensure that this policy is enforced? So I think your question is about how we implement the policy. So The policy is implemented at the peer review and programmatic levels. So first, we change the instructions to applicants to include these new requirements. We identify the part of the application, it's in the research strategy, 
where SABB is supposed to be addressed when an investigator is describing the designs that they're going to employ to answer their research question. And then we instructed peer reviewers on how to assess how well SABB is considered. We provided training materials to NIH scientific review officers who are the folks that interact with the peer reviewers and who lead the review meetings along with the study section chair. And so that material has been provided to assist individuals in both incorporating SABB into their application and then the peer reviewers for assessing how well applicants have incorporated that information. The next level is programmatic oversight. So once you get an NIH grant, once a year, you have to report on your progress in what's called an RPPR, progress report. And in that progress report, we're expecting that information related to SABV is included as it's being captured. Now, on any given year, there may be limited information, but over a five-year period of a grant, over time, it's expected that that information will be included. And so the same is true for inclusion for clinical studies. So investigators tell us how they plan to recruit women, and they tell us the numbers of individuals they plan to recruit in each of their treatment arms for clinical studies. And then each year they report on their accrual of research participants. If they're off track, the program officer provides them with feedback and guides them on how to get back on track so that they can meet their inclusion target. So over time, there's an interaction between the program official and the investigator to ensure that policies like the NIH inclusion policy and the NIH sex as a biological variable policy are indeed adhered to over the course of the grant period and that the progress reports do include that information. After the progress report, the final progress report, that's where publications come in. And we are working with journal editors and publishers to encourage them to require sex-specific results reporting in publications. And there are some journals, quite a few, that have adopted guidelines that do indeed require manuscript authors to report results by sex for the primary outcome measure. I'm really excited to share with you that one of the provisions of the 21st Century Cures Act is that for all applicable phase three clinical trials, that the results from those clinical trials will be inserted into the website, clinicaltrials.gov, disaggregated by sex, gender, and race and ethnicity. That's a new requirement of the 21st Century Cures Act. And we're really looking forward to being able to see that data for the first time in clinicaltrials.gov, where all phase three clinical trials must be registered, and now where results will be deposited. That's really great news. It's really exciting. It's going to take a little while, though, to get some of those results because it applies to studies that were started after just a few years ago. And as you know, the average clinical trial takes several years to complete, and then the publications take a little while thereafter. But I'm really looking forward to seeing that data that was formerly hidden in plain sight. So there's a lot of progress that's been made. And so I was thinking about some of the trials that I've been looking at recently, and it looks like we still are not, I mean, looking at anything that's even close to 50-50 in terms of gender parity. And one of the things that people always bring up is the idea of excluding women because of their being of childbearing age and their concern for having birth defects with any kind of new drug that they're testing. And so I guess in your opinion, how would you weigh the risks and benefits of including these women and especially pregnant women? A great question, Siri. It's so important that women who are pregnant and women that are lactating be included in clinical research studies so that we can generate information that's relevant to pregnant and lactating women to guide clinical decisions. And of course, these are populations that are different, and we need to take that into consideration. Right now, as you said, we're not enrolling pregnant women in a lot of clinical studies. And the way we approach clinical research is generally to start with adults and then move to children and pregnant women. The Task Force for Pregnant and Lactating Women recently published implementation recommendations for their 2018 report. 
And in that report, they talked about changing the culture to protect pregnant women through research instead of from research, removing pregnant women as a vulnerable population through the U.S. Common Rule, and expanding the workforce of people with expertise in obstetric and lactation pharmacology and therapeutics so that we could do a better job. And so as we work to implement that, one of the key points is establishing a prioritization process for studying therapeutics used during pregnancy and lactation, because we know that pregnant women need to take medications for pre-existing medical problems, and that pregnant women do indeed take medications, and many of them are prescription medications. So to address ethical considerations, as you mentioned, it's important to weigh the risks and benefits of any research study for any participant, but in particular for pregnant women, to look at the potential to generate evidence that will inform clinical decisions and how that compares to the risks to the pregnant woman. So that is a challenge and that ethical consideration is part of the responsibility of the clinical investigator, the institutional review boards, and others who help design and conduct such studies. So it's really important to educate and raise awareness among healthcare providers, among pregnant and lactating women, among IRBs and investigators on ways that we can conduct research in pregnant women. We may need to use different study designs, considering alternative trial designs, using registries, creating unique partnerships. So we do have to work a little harder to do this But it's important that we do so, so that we can generate evidence so that it can be safer for women to be able to take medications that she may need during a pregnancy and that clinicians can be provided with the evidence that they need to help a woman make those decisions. I really like that idea and reframing that happens when you say protecting women through research instead of from research. Now with COVID-19 and the rapid nature of trials, do you feel that women are still being included? So the rules apply, and they're more important than ever. NIH policies apply to NIH-supported clinical studies. And in fact, the COVID-19 NIH strategic plan specifically articulates the importance of including women, the importance of addressing sex and gender, the importance of addressing vulnerable populations, vulnerable to COVID, including underrepresented groups. And so we're seeing the importance of this issue be elevated rather than decreased. And as you know, we're seeing higher rates of fatality in men, especially older men with COVID, but we're seeing equal numbers of cases between women and men, right? So women are exposed to COVID more because women represent 70% of healthcare workers, 70% of essential workers. So their exposure is based on their gender roles and the roles that they play in the employment. And for men, we're seeing something different in terms of outcomes. For pregnant women, it's even more complicated, Siri, and that's why it's so important that we design our studies with this information in mind from the outset. It's not something you should add on later. We really think that accounting for sex as a biological variable by including women and men, by thinking about these issues in the preclinical studies with the laboratory models of SARS-CoV-2 infection, looking at male and female animals is value added, not something that you can add on later. It's harder to retrofit something. And it's important for everybody to do this from the beginning of the research process when you think about the research question all the way to the end. There's also this new concept in medical schools now where with every systems-based module that you do, there's kind of a chapter talking about how it's different in women and focusing on that. What do you think about that? Bringing that perspective into medical curriculum is a fantastic way to raise awareness and to provide that educational material for residents, medical students, and the like. So thinking about how something could be different for women is a quick way for anybody to put on their sex and gender glasses and have a new perspective. And it's really about changing the way we think about a topic. Because we now know every single cell in your body has a sex, sex matters, it has ramifications from the cellular and subcellular level, all the way to the level of ourselves as organisms, we must incorporate this perspective. So I love to hear about ways that medical schools are adapting and including it into their curriculum 
And I'd love to see more of that. And so in the perspective of residents and fellows, especially on the clinical side of it, I mean, what can we do to be more mindful of this disparity and then to also make sure that our female patients have easier access to enrolling in trials? One of the things I think that residents and fellows can do is to make sure that they understand how sex and gender influence health and disease. And that they can do by taking online courses, by paying attention to the materials that are presented in the medical and resident curriculum. And I'm pleased to tell you that LRWH collaborated with the FDA's Office of Women's Health to create a bench to bedside online course on integrating sex and gender to improve human health. It has six modules, including topics like immunology, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, neurology, endocrinology, and mental health. And it talks about how sex and gender affect how patients present with disease, how they respond to treatments, how there may be differences and adverse effects from interventions. So the first thing that residents and fellows can do is make sure that they are pursuing that information themselves. Then as they're participating in research studies, they may be helping to recruit and retain participants, asking questions about how are we reaching out to women and underrepresented groups to be participants in this clinical protocol? Are we designing our recruitment materials in a way that they will be appealing to women? Are we offering study visits in hours that women who may have caregiving responsibilities could actually really attend their study visit? Are we offering childcare or transportation costs to potential research participants to make sure that we can have diverse participants in the clinical study so that when we generate the results, We understand to which populations the results apply and that we can learn from that evidence and learn how to apply it and to give individualized treatment to all of our patients. Every single patient deserves information and evidence and recommendations from their clinician that are based on people like them. So unless we include women of all ages, women from underrepresented groups, older people, children, pregnant women, lactating women, in clinical research studies, we're not going to generate enough evidence to give our clinicians what they need. So there's a big knowledge gap to expand. And so I'm excited that residents and fellows could play an important role. And residents and fellows are the leaders of tomorrow. You are the principal investigators of tomorrow. You are the department heads of tomorrow. You're the deans and presidents of universities of tomorrow. So you are in a position to influence many aspects of the biomedical research enterprise by just asking questions and by changing the way medicine is done in the future. So Dr. Clayton, how easy is this course for residents? What would they have to do to get started? The course is really easy to take. Their modules are individualized, so you can just do one between morning rounds and afternoon clinic and pop in and just pull up one of the modules. You can take them separately. They're quick and easy. And I also want to make sure that you know about the NIH Inclusion Outreach Toolkit that we have available on the ORWH website. That has case studies, vignettes, policies, checklists, and other quick tips and tricks that anyone can use to help design better studies in terms of including women and underrepresented groups. All of this is available on the ORWH website. Thank you, Dr. Clayton. That was helpful and inspiring. I learned a lot and I think our listeners will too. So this wraps up another episode of Curbside Consults. I'd like to thank Dr. Clayton for joining us today. Our production team here at NEJM Resident 360 includes Karen Buckley, Lynn Winston Perry, Kyle Simmons, Mike Tomases, Tim Vining, Scott Williams, and Kathy Stern. Special thanks also to our NEJM education editor, Dr. Opie Hamvik. If you have any questions, feedback, or suggestions for future podcast topics, please email us at resident360 at nejm.org. Remember to subscribe to the NEJM social media sites, including Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook via the nejm.org pages. On behalf of the New England Journal of Medicine, this is Siri signing off.